Hi, everybody. Welcome to Humane Voices. Uh, we're really excited to be here today, and we're going to be doing things just a little bit differently over the next few episodes, um, bringing you uh, along with, with me um, several different co-hosts from across the organization. Uh, it's going to be really exciting, get some more sort of new personalities into the show. Um, today, I've got Lauren Reese as my co-host. Lauren, welcome. I'm so happy to have you here. How are you doing today? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. You know, it, it's a little surreal uh, because I have been a listener for such a long time to the podcast. So this is definitely going to be a, a interesting and um, a fun experience. So thank you so much for, for having me. All right, Lauren, it's great to have you here. Um, why don't we start getting into today's topic? So there was a really big win for animals that happened recently. A federal judge restored Endangered Species Act protections for wolves, and this is a huge victory for these iconic animals, uh, especially because they were facing hunting seasons in several states. So today we're going to talk about that decision, how it came about, and we're also going to talk about what it means for the future of wolves in the United States. So today our guests are Amanda White, Program Manager of Wildlife, and Nick Arivo, Managing Attorney for the Wildlife Group of Animal Protection Law. So thank you both for joining us, and we're so excited to have you on today. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, I'm really excited to have you guys on. And Amanda, welcome back. You know, like it's it's nice to be here discussing good news for wolves since the last time we had you on. It was sort of a real sort of doom and gloom kind of picture and sort of getting some light into the room is is always really nice. I mean, we get to we want to celebrate those things when they happen. Yeah, it's been a long fight. So we're, we've definitely been celebrating the win here. Yeah. And I mean, I think, you know, first, just congrats to you both. I mean, this is such a huge victory. So. I mean, can you tell us, I mean, how did, how did this start? I mean, you know, how did we get here? There was a, a lawsuit. I mean, can you tell us more? Sure. So this victory was brought about by a lawsuit that HSUS filed along with a, a fabulous coalition of um, conservation and animal protection groups. We sued the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which is the federal agency that is responsible for making decisions about listing and delisting species under the Endangered Species Act. Um, we sued them last January 2020, uh, 2021, sorry, um, you know, immediately after the delisting went into effect and basically put forward a number of claims arguing that the delisting was scientifically uh, unjustified, that it was uh, unlawful under the Endangered Species Act, and essentially that it was premature because wolves um, were still threatened and not yet recovered across the lower 48 states. So you guys have been really busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, what, what had kind of led up to this moment that that um, that you guys, that we decided to sort of go in with a lawsuit? I mean, I know that the Trump administration had kind of removed protections for, for wolves. And what were the what were those results of, of them doing that? Yeah, so the wolves that were most affected by that 2020 delisting decision that removed those protections for wolves were really wolves in the Great Lakes region. So that's Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin. Um, and the state agencies in Michigan and Minnesota they both kind of took a step back and said, you know what, our, our state wolf management plans are pretty old. Minnesota's was like 20 years old. Michigan's was last updated in 2015. So they both decided to do the work, update those plans before they would consider whether or not to hold the season. Um, that's not to say those wolves were ever fully safe. Uh, we did see attempts in the Minnesota legislature to force a season. Um, and in Michigan, it was entirely possible that the Natural Resources Commission could have authorized one, uh, but thankfully neither of those things happened before wolves were relisted. Mm. Um, unfortunately, wolves in Wisconsin were not so lucky. Um, Wisconsin's the only state that has a law in the books that mandates a wolf hunting and trapping season when wolves are not federally protected. Um, and I know our Wisconsin State Director, Megan Nicholson and I were on here last year to talk a little bit about what happened in Wisconsin. But just really briefly, um, a misguided court decision forced the state to rush into a wolf hunting season in February of last year. And in just 60 hours, you know, trophy hunters and trappers blew past the quota of 119 wolves and killed 218 wolves um, in just a really horrible hunt that took place. Mm. Um, and then just really quickly, uh, even though the 2020 delisting decision did not affect wolves, 
in the Northern Rockies, um, since they had already been delisted, it was almost like those states didn't want to be outdone. Um, Mm -hmm. And so Idaho and Montana both passed some really bad laws and regulations that drastically increase the number of wolves that can be killed there. Mm. Is this kind of thing that goes on with sort of um, the protections and then the stripping of protections with wolves? is, Is it kind of a cyclical thing? It's happened before, right? It's happened, yeah, many times before, essentially since 2003, um, when the federal government first proposed to delist wolves. um, We've seen attempts to delist either nationwide or in certain parts of the country uh, almost every, you know, three or four years. Um, Mm -hmm. Most recently, uh, in 2011, um, wolves in the Great Lakes state, so Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan primarily, uh, had their protection strips. We saw three really brutal, really gruesome seasons um, of trophy hunting in those states before another lawsuit that we led uh, was able to restore protections in 2014, which was then upheld by an appeals court in 2017. So this is not new. This is something that we've seen recur repeatedly, even though the service keeps getting, you know, uh, reversed by by federal courts. Um, They don't seem to uh, get the message that they need to mm-hmm. fundamentally, I think, rethink their approach to wolf recovery. Um, and it's something that HSUS has been really leading the fight on, on the ground in the courts for decades now. Mm-hmm. I would just add, you know, our, our opponents sort of like to, to paint it as this sort of equal, you know, back and forth battle over who gets to manage wolves when really it's, you know, the fact is that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service keeps prematurely delisting wolves without taking into consideration the threats they face in these states. And the courts keep having to remind them of that. So it's really just been a consistent, you know, wolves are not ready to be delisted. Mm. Yeah, and and sort of going off what you guys are both saying, I mean, I've read, you know, National Geographic has called it, you know, the chaotic world of wolf conservation, right? Because there it keeps going back and forth. And so why is it that you see, you know, the, these states, um, and and also federally, like prematurely de- delisting the species, which is obviously you know endangered. I mean, why why are there these these attempts that keep happening? I think a lot of it is that quite simply, wolf recovery, real wolf recovery across you know the country is is hard work, and the service wants to walk away from it. I think the service's view is that they've done enough. Um, they have a very unambitious. Uh, sense mm-hmm. of what it, it what's required to declare sort of mission accomplished with wolves. Um, to step back, you know, when wolves were listed originally under the ESA in 1978, they were almost entirely extirpated in the United States, the lower 48. Um, there were small populations in the very, very north woods of Minnesota and an Isle Royale National Park uh, in, in Michigan. And that was it. Um, you know, for perspective, they once roamed throughout almost every state in the country, um, you know, before European contact and were pretty much wiped out down to that little small portion of their range by the mid 20th century. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, the services view is that there are, because of genuinely, you know, like successful and, and admirable recovery efforts, there are uh, some comparatively stable populations in a few places in, you know, mm-hmm. the Yellowstone National Park region around the Northern Rockies and in some of the Western Great Lakes states. and you know, in their perspective, that's enough. And that the fact that there are wolves doing sort of all right in those places means they can walk away from the more than 90% of historic range of wolves that remains unoccupied today. So in terms of this lady, latest ruling, I mean, I know you mentioned different pop- populations of wolves around the country. Like, is this ruling something that will impact like all wolves across the country? Like, wh- where and what are the effects and kind of where does it leave wolves in the United States and what do we need to do next? So it's a really important reprieve. I don't want to downplay how how mm-hmm. big a, a victory it is because it it does affect wolves across most, but not all, of the lower forty eight. Um, everywhere where we have wolves, except for the northern Rocky states of Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming, essentially those mm-hmm. those were not part of this lawsuit because they were separately delisted in a separate federal action, hmm, um, okay. like almost a decade ago now. Uh, so they're still delisted. Like Amanda was talking about, um, they're still under sort of heavy threats in those states, and that's something we can get into in a minute. But um, but the, the good news is that wolves everywhere else are back on mm. the list for now. And uh, that means, I think, most imminently that, you know, we're not going to see 
the trophy hunting seasons that we were likely to see or guaranteed to see in Wisconsin and likely to see follow in other states um, in the not too distant future. Hmm. So like a repeat of that horrible February hunt from last year was probably Mm -hmm. in the cards if it weren't for this. Hmm. Unbelievable. Man. And, and who are these people who are, you know, trying to delist, you know, our supporters of the delisting of, of these wolves? I mean, obviously there's gotta be some of them because it keeps happening. Right. Yeah, it's really just, you know, a small handful of people who wield a really disproportionate amount of influence on decision makers. You know, we're not talking about your average fair chase hunter who, you know, hunts deer to put food on the table. We're really talking about a small number of trophy hunters who are killing wolves for display and for bragging rights and social media pictures. Um, And also, you know, some livestock producers also, you know, push for killing wolves because, they blame wolves for some of their losses. Um, but, you know, as I'm, as we've talked about on this show before, um, those conflicts between wolves and livestock are actually really rare. Um, and there are highly effective non-lethal tools that can be used to prevent those conflicts from happening in the first place. Um, and then there are, you know, those who harbor a really visceral, disturbing hatred of wolves and want to kill as many of them as they can. So... Where are we now with wolves? I mean, is 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 this it? Are they are they protected? I mean, are is there a chance that you know we could go back and forth again? Are they in limbo? I mean, I mean, what's what does the future look like? Yeah, Nick, you mentioned that let like we should talk about the populations that are still that are not impacted by this ruling. Like, what is what is that sort of little um, little group, and and what what needs to happen there? So yeah, of the wolves that aren't affected by this ruling, uh, the Northern Rockies wolves primarily, um, we are in the middle right now of a kind of radically expanded hunting and, and trapping season in the states of Idaho and Montana. Amanda alluded to um, state legislators in both of those two states mm-hmm. uh, passing some just egregious, aggressive um, wolf you know, decimation bills essentially hmm. last year that... Um, took what was already a very uh, aggressive wolf hunting and and trapping program in those states and kind of turned it up to 11 uh, by Mm. authorizing all kinds of uh, new, cruel, egregious, indiscriminate killing methods, expanding the length of seasons, removing limits on the numbers of wolves that individuals can take. Um, And so we're, you know, we've been very focused at the same time we're working on this lawsuit, but very focused on um, working to restore protections for wolves in those states, which uh, right now we have submitted a petition um, to the Fish and Wildlife Service to to relist wolves in those states, primarily on the basis of the, you know, like very serious new threat posed by these uh, horrible new state laws. Um, the service is taking that under consideration and is currently sort of deciding what to do. And there's an open public comment period. I think Amanda can talk about how you know members and supporters can get involved in that. Yeah, I think one thing I was going to ask you guys, just out of curiosity, is like what's what's kind of in play in these states where I mean, is is there sort of a different sort of political dynamic in play in this? I mean, I was wondering if it, is it ranching interests, is it something else? Like what what is makes the kind of distinction between what's going on with wolves in the Northern Rockies versus other places, and and kind of like turns up the volume in that area. You know what it boils down to is those few people who want to kill wolves that we talked about earlier, like the trophy hunters and some of the livestock producers are the same people who tend to get appointed to the bodies that make decisions about seasons, um, Mm. like fishing game commissions and that kind of thing. Um, And as we saw, you know, in Montana last year, it was really just one or two legislators that pushed through that whole suite of of new laws um, that drastically expanded the wolf killing. And I think they were able to do that thanks to some, you know, partisan politics that were at at play. Um, And there there really just also needs to be some more public education about wolves and the benefits they bring and also about the Endangered Species Act and its purpose. Yeah, I'd like to echo what Amanda just said. And I think in addition to legislators, um, you know, the the state agencies, the, the wildlife commissioners that, you know, have the primary responsibility for making policy decisions about wildlife once there's no federal protections in place are uh, typically in a lot of states, not every state, 
not very representative of the actual views and, and values and, and ethics of, mm. of the people of the state. You know, even in places like the entire country where, you know, the trophy hunting of wolves is um, highly unpopular, uh, the, the commissions kind of uh, represent disproportionately those ranching and hunting and trapping interests. And in fact, a lot of states, you know, baked right into the laws that define um, and create those commissions they sort of guarantee seats. You know, if it's a seven member commission, oftentimes we'll see three seats given to ranchers, hunting groups and, and trapping groups um, yes. where conservation wow. and wildlife protection groups are, are lucky to have one. So I think um, there's a disconnect, a kind of undemocratic disconnect between uh, what the decision makers represent and the actual, you know, what the science says and what the will of the people is. Um, I, I keep hearing, you know, you guys mentioned the, the Northern Rockies and how there are these wolf populations there and obviously how, how they're still delisted. Um, but what would you say to the argument of people who say, you know, at least for me, I, I think of the North, when I think of the Northern Rock, Rockies, I think of, you know, national parks and these like protected areas. And so what do you say to people who say, well, you know, they live on protected lands there, even if they're delisted. So, I mean, what's the response to that? Yeah, you know, even in Yellowstone this year, you know, those those wolves don't see those borders of the park, right? So they often will cross outside of the parks. And just, you know, in the last couple of months, we've seen 24, I think, Yellowstone wolves get killed by trophy hunters in mm -hmm. Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming when they wander outside of the park. Um, and then, you know, there, there are hundreds of wolves who live outside of those park boundaries that are not protected. Um, and I think I saw this morning um, that 500 wolves so far or over 500 have been killed in those three states um, just since you know the start of the season in the fall. What is it with wolves? Like, it, it just seems like they're one of these animals that people just freak out about. And I, I mean, you know, uh, it, it, always, it always strikes me these bizarre sort of targeting of particular species, um, like wolves seem to be one of the species that really gets it. Yeah, they do. And I don't know why, because they're so interesting and social. And, and like we were talking about with Dr. Vucicic the last time he was on, um, they're really just fascinating animals and they really don't pose a threat to to people or livestock, mm -hmm. um, unless, <laughs> unless you're in a Liam Neeson movie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Let's not re re rely on Liam Neeson for our science. That's probably a good a good thing to follow everywhere you go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, they there's never been a documented you know human death due to wolves in the lower forty eight. They they really mm -hmm. are shy and elusive and and keep to themselves. All right. So, I mean, obviously, you know, when we talk about animal protection and things, we think about like being on the ground and like being there with the animals. But can we talk a little bit about, you know, how important taking legal action is into to protecting animals as well? Yeah. So I think that's part of what makes HSUS such an effective and, and fabulous organization is that we have we have a really big toolbox. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we are able we have the capacity and the people and the expertise to engage on, you know, really uh, sticky, complicated issues like wolf conservation at every level that we need to. Um, that means litigation sometimes. That means, you know, policy engagement, grassroots campaigns, uh, work on the Hill, uh, work in state, you know, legislatures. Um, and we've got the ability to engage in all of those levels. Um, with respect to you know the the lawyers and the litigation side of things. Um, I think you know this this is a a great example of some of the really uh, groundbreaking and important Endangered Species Act work that we do. Um, you know we've we've like I said been on the ground and in courts fighting for wolves for for decades. And in fact, this most recent opinion um, was influenced very heavily by precedent that was set in that Great Lakes wolves case that uh, HSUS. Uh, litigated back in 2017. Um, and I think, you know, if you look at grizzly bears and some of our uh, work to protect foreign species, we have a, a large portfolio of, of work in courts to use the ESA to keep some of the most, you know, iconic 
and um, beloved wildlife species in the U.S. and abroad out of the crosshairs of trophy hunters. Um, but it's not just wildlife work, not just ESA work. They have a lot of really interesting and uh, valuable litigation going on now around, you know, consumer protection cases um, to uh, ensure that, you know, consumers that want to do the right thing and be humane conscious and their in their decisions are actually able to do so and aren't misled. So we have cases, you know, against unscrupulous online um, vendors of of puppies. Uh, mm. And we have cases, you know, against some of the sort of largest like pork producers in the country, challenging, misleading claims that they're making about the humaneness of their products. Um, there's also a lot of legislative uh, work that our attorneys are involved with. We, you know, HSUS is, is fabulous about um, advocating for, you know, municipal, state, and federal laws on all of our major priority issues. And um, at the attorneys in, in, our, in our shop uh, do a lot of behind the scenes work, you know, drafting those bills, making sure that they're airtight and actually accomplish what we need them to. And then, you know, defending them once they're passed, when they're inevitably challenged by, you know, the animal abusers and the animal use industries that want to see them rolled back and want to kind of thwart the democratic process. And so, mm. you know, we've got a lot of cases defending things like, you know, California's uh, Prop 12 and other kind of farm animal confinement laws, things like, you know, fur ban legislation um, that's really taken a hold throughout the country um, and some of the retail uh, commercially bred puppies uh, bills as well. Those are all kind of in courts right now. And we're doing our mm. best to defend them. Thanks for giving that context, Nick. I, I, I frankly, I just love this because I, I don't know if you guys remember, but we had that industry front group coming after us a while ago. And one of their like hit, hits against us was why does HSUS have lawyers? And I think you just provided <laughs> such a great example of why we have lawyers and the incredible work that they can do for animals. Like I, I completely agree with you. It's one of the most special things we do. And I, I think it's extraordinary what we've managed to accomplish on so many different issues here. So for anyone who's listening and, you know, curious about what they can do, I mean, you know, how can, how can we stay on top of this and, and how can people get involved? Yeah, I think the first thing is to take a deep breath, celebrate, you know, this was a, a happy tears for days kind of victory. Um, so do, you know, take a minute to celebrate that. Um, and then, you know, the next biggest thing is to send a comment to the Fish and Wildlife Service and tell them that you know, they need to relist wolves in the Northern Rockies. And we've made it really easy for people to do that on our website. Uh, you can just go to humanesociety.org slash protect NRM wolves. Uh, and if you live in a state with wolves, I would also recommend uh, making sure you're signed up to receive updates from your state director about what's going on in your state um, and also following your state HSUS page on Facebook. Um, that's going to be the best way to keep informed about any actions that you might need to take in your state. Amanda, Nick, thank you so much for being here. Congratulations on this great news. I know you guys will be getting back to work immediately and so will the rest of us. And thanks so much for providing our listeners with the sort of insights on what they can do to support this effort. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's all for Humane Voices today. Uh, We will see you next time on the show. Thanks so much to our guests and Lauren, thanks for being here. Thanks so much.